Thirty-eight. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this, we hope, interesting and informative uh, spotlight program. I'm Dave Myers. I'm with the uh, Berks Alliance. Uh, we'll be really starting the program here in a minute, but I'm going to turn it over quickly to the chair of the Berks Alliance, uh, John Weidenhammer. John. Thanks, Dave. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining our program. We think we have a particularly important topic uh, for today's uh, presentation. I want to thank Dave for all of his efforts to kind of corral our presenters and to put this program together. But I especially want to thank our uh, presenters for the work that they have done and will do to uh, present this, uh, this, again, important topic. So again, thank you all for participating uh, today. Uh, if you have ideas for things you'd like us to present as the Berks Alliance in the future, we'd be happy to sort of explore those ideas. Dave has proven to be very clever at finding presenters for a wide, a wide range of topics of import to our community. So with that, Dave, I'll turn it back to you. We can get things going. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and I'm going to really quickly cover some ground rules that we have for the program. Um, what we do is ask you to uh, mute your microphone, but keep your camera on so we can see you. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen, there's a chat function. We ask you to use that to submit comments and questions. Once we get done with the formal presentations, we will uh, share those questions and comments. Um, if we don't get through all the questions and comments during that period, we will write them up and share them with our presenters and have them give us responses as well. So as John said, we'll be sending out the video to everybody who registered. Uh, feel free to make use of the video if you like in some, any other way. We'll also be sending you the PowerPoint presentation from today. Um, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to a very important person here in Berks County, former Judge Art Graham. Art? Uh, thank you, Dave, and greetings to all of you, some of whom I see and some of whom I don't, but many of whom I know. Uh, folks, I'm sitting here in Montreal looking out at a beautiful day, and I hope you're doing the same in Berks County. There's a Pennsylvania Dutch saying that many of you may recall. My granddad used it years ago, and he would say, quote, we get too soon old and too late smart, close quote. <laughs> well, the old I can relate to, unfortunately, and there's not a hell of a lot I can do about that. But all of us can be committed to doing what we need to do to be smart. Smart about ending mass incarceration, smart about improving our justice system that ensures fairness, promotes safety, and strengthens communities. I'm sure you all have heard that the United States has a high rate of incarceration. And this doesn't just mean people behind bars, because many people are also under various forms of supervision, probation and parole, that places a lot of restrictions on their freedom and their mobility. The sen sentencing project notes that in the space of 50 years from the early 1970s, when we were a nation of 203 million people, until today when we're a nation of 332 million people, that people under supervision have gone from approximately 360,000 in the early 70s to more than 5 million today. That's a growth of 1.5 in our population, but 15 fold in those people that are under supervision. Mass incarceration can often feel like an abstract concept, but I lived through that get tough on crime trend as a judge and I participated in it. And I saw firsthand what it does to individuals, to families and communities as a whole. And it's expensive in more ways than one. We spend a heck of a lot of money locking people up who break our laws, more than you may realize. And it makes, in my opinion, sense to me to take a hard look at not just where the money goes, but what else it costs us as a community. Research suggests that the social and fis fiscal costs associated with a half century investment in Get Tough on Crime simply have not produced the result that we anticipated. That's part of the reason that I was so glad to learn that there were two committed local justice advocates that had embarked on an in-depth research-based study of whom we choose to jail here in Berks 
why we do it, for how long we do it, and to what effect. Last fall, prompted by the county's plan to build an extraordinarily expensive new jail, Crystal Kowalski and Jane Palmer, in large part due to a grant that they got, established a partnership with the Vera Institute. And the Vera Institute is a highly respected national justice organization. Our group in Berks County is called, is called Building Justice in Berks. And that team has been working for months on learning how the system works here and to augment the work that's already been done by our committed, and I mean this, our committed county commissioners. They've talked to more than 120 folks who have been impacted by incarceration. Many of those people were labeled as, quote, criminals, close quote, but many times they're people who want nothing more than a chance to get out from under that label and live a good life. It's safe to say that due to a range of interlocking factors that include poverty, race, and mental illness, and make re-entry really challenging, that too many people are spending too much time in Berks County Prison. As much as we might believe otherwise, this does very, very little to improve public safety, and it's economically and psychologically harmful to individuals and families and our whole community. And even more unsettling, we know that when people fail to return successfully to their communities, we all suffer. Individuals suffer from homelessness, joblessness, powerlessness, frustration, and loss of self-esteem. Families, including children, suffer from the loss of a breadwinner, a caregiver, a loved family member. Tragically, new victims may emerge and suffer, and communities suffer the loss of economic multipliers that could make the difference, a hell of a difference, between prosperity and decline. The jail suffers from understaffing and, and overwork, and the county and all of us, we end up paying the price. There are systemic issues here that none of us are really able to control, but there are some things that we can and should do that will increase, not threaten public safety, and help keep families intact, lower taxpayer costs, and put Burks firmly in the forefront of criminal justice reform. We've, got, we've done a lot of good work, but working together, we can continue to make a difference. It's now my privilege to introduce Baya Halbach Singh, Senior Research Associate of the Vera Institute of Justice, who will begin the discussion. Baya? Thank you so much for that, Art. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. Uh, could I get a thumbs up from a couple of people? Um, Art, Crystal, I see you on my screen, if you see the presentation. Okay, wonderful. Um, so as Art, um, as Art mentioned, my name is Bea Halbat Singh. I work as a researcher for the Vera Institute of Justice, a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization focused on criminal justice reform. And we use research and advocacy to drive effective criminal justice policy. Within Vera, my team works primarily on jails, um, reducing the overuse and the misuse of jails, which is most people's first point of interaction with the criminal legal system. As Art mentioned, we all started working with Building Justice in Berks last fall, and we're here because we all want Berks to thrive economically in terms of safety and health and with careful stewardship of resources. On its website, the Berks Alliance says its goal is to influence, lead, and implement strategies to build a strong, vibrant community. And as business leaders, um, the folks here are a key part of this conversation. Today, we wanted to talk about one aspect of this, which is the way we use the local county jail. Our goal is to build knowledge about the connections between the local criminal justice system and the county's economic well being. And uh, we hope that you, as business leaders, will engage with county decisions about both how local tax revenue is allocated and about programs that support formerly incarcerated people to participate fully uh, in the workforce. Um, so we want to focus today on three key points. First, we're going to look at the big picture, how widespread county jail detention is, some of the damage that jail detention has on people, families, and communities, and why jail doesn't really accomplish the goals that we think it does. Then we'll zoom in on Berks County and look at how the jail impacts the local economy, how the county is currently spending its budget on jail and related costs, and comparing these to resources on uh, for programs that prevent crime. 
And finally, we'll talk about some of the obstacles that people face when trying to find work after spending time in jail. So across the country, there are approximately 1.8 million people behind bars, and that includes about 1.2 million people in state and federal prisons and over 600,000 people in local jails. Jails are typically locally run facilities, which are used to hold people who are either awaiting trial or serving shorter local sentences, whereas prisons are typically state or federal uh, run facilities where people are serving longer sentences. It's a little confusing because in Pennsylvania, jails are often referred uh, to as county prisons, but in most places across the country, these are called jails. So throughout this presentation, we're going to be referring to the local county prison as a jail. Nearly every county in the US has a jail and local decision makers do actually have a lot of agency over how jails are used. Um, that being said, crime and violence are real concerns and we should all take those seriously. We all wanna prevent these things from happening and use our resources to respond effectively when it does occur. But often we think of jail as a solution to crime and violence. Um, and today we'll share some data and examples to challenge this idea. Research and experiences from across the country show that the way that jails are used are not effective at preventing or deterring crime, and it can often make people more likely to re-engage in crime. It also has really dramatic negative effects on individuals, families, and communities, and it's a very expensive item in the county budget. Um, before getting to that, I want to pass it to uh, Jordan to talk about some of the connections between the jail and community well-being. Uh, thank you, Bea. Um, some of you do know me, uh, but for those that don't, my name is Jordan Henning. I'm a licensed social worker in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, adjunct professor of social work, um, and currently a uh, doctoral student at Millersville University. Um, I would like to thank also uh, Crystal and Jane, Building Justice in Berks, um, for bringing me into this, and the Vera Institute for their advocacy and guidance, uh, as well as the Berks Alliance and the Berks Community Foundation for setting this up for us today. Um, so we can go to the next slide then, Bea. Um, so why are you seeing a slide that says migraines? Um, first and foremost, there is some overlap here um, in the context of macroeconomic impact. Um, and a lot of times migraine is much more relatable and understandable um, for individuals and business owners. Um, approximately 10% of the adult population uh, suffers from migraines. Uh, migraine involvement and its relation to employment is usually measured in days, maybe weeks for in some individuals. Um, and, and migraines generally tend to impact the person who suffers from them and then maybe their employer and one or two other people. Um, why is this all relevant? We'll get to that in just a second. Um, but as you can see by the, the info, um, there have been a number of studies and on average it, it has been estimated, but also pretty, pretty well studied that migraines cost the US economy about $13 billion per year. Um, that's broken into three general categories of the, the more macro level stuff, disability from the government and employers, lost wages, unemployment payments, um, a smaller chunk of uh, lost productivity from people being removed from the workplace, and then um, that smallest chunk um, of direct medical costs. Um, so why is that important? Because unlike migraines, the economic impact of incarceration is broad, complex, far ranging, multiplicative, and not easily quantifiable. Um, two of the multiplier effects that we specifically, or that I will specifically touch on right now, is that estimates of the number of people impacted per incarcerated person can range anywhere from 10 to 30 other individuals who are directly uh, impacted as a result of someone uh, becoming incarcerated. And just for a local statistic to bring into the conversation, the average length of time that a person is removed from the workforce regarding incarceration um, from the jail statistics show that the average person is there for 67 days. Um, so lastly, as you can see, that, that much larger uh, $182 billion graph. Um, that was a 2017 study by the Prison Policy Initiative that estimated that that $182 billion is just inclusive of the government spending 
on incarceration combined with the costs that are directly impacted on incarcerated individuals and their families. So essentially, 182 billion or more than 12 times migraines, but that is just scratching the surface of the true costs. If you want to go to the next slide, Bea. Um, so these bubbles are all inclusive of different ways that incarceration can impact individuals and their families. I'm not going to read them all, but I'm going to talk about some of them. Um, so as you can see, they can impact the individual and their family members in behavioral and physical health concerns, food insecurity, housing insecurity, and homelessness, other poverty measures, um, socioeconomic status, lifetime earnings, schooling, and, and childhood trauma. And that's going to be the thing I'm going to talk most about right now. Um, one of the costliest measures not included in the $182 billion is the effects of incarceration of adults on any children um, that might be involved. Um, it is estimated that out of the 1.8, 1.9 million people incarcerated that Bea already mentioned, plus the additional estimated six and a half million um, individuals on probation or parole supervision, that there are 10 million children currently in the United States that are directly impacted um, by the criminal justice system. Now, in my sphere um, of work and social work, why this is so important is because of something called the Adverse Childhood Experience Checklist. It's a measure that's been evidence-based and uh, extensively studied for its health impacts. Um, there's, oh, and then uh, for when you actually conduct the study, it's called ACEs for adults, but uh, pearls for when you're actually conducting it on a child. Uh, they're just, it's the same thing, but just they're worded differently based on age and, um, you know, verbiage. Um, but there are 10 questions. Um, and one of them is literally, did you live with anyone who went to jail or prison? But substantially, that single question also impacts two or three other measures that are also on that uh, checklist. Um, inclusive of housing and food insecurity, and again, other issues related to poverty. Um, so not only does the incarceration increase these ACE scores, which I'll get to a statistic um, in just a second that's relevant to this, um, but they can also impact children in causing or exacerbating mental health diagnoses. They can cause complicated grief and loss issues, uh, feelings of guilt or shame, social stigma or social exclusion. It can negatively impact their school participation and or grades. It can increase dropout rates for individual for children, and it can increase the child and family involvement in the children and youth services, um, depending on what that's called in, in each county. Um, so why do I bring up the ACE scores here? Well, according to a 2023 study, Quote, the national economic burden of ACE-related adult health conditions was $14.1 trillion annually, $183 billion in direct medical spending, and $13.9 trillion in lost healthy life years, which comes out to $88,000 per affected adult annually, or $2.4 million over their lifetime. These ACE scores elucidate an insidious aspect of incarceration that it is a self-fueling problem. IG, or sorry, that is children are more likely to get involved if their parents were also involved. And if the children somehow do not become involved, there is an increased likelihood of significant potential economic impact on their lives in the future. The last point I want to talk about was another study by the Prison Policy Initiative, and that is a recent survey of incarcerated individuals found that 38% of them had their first contact with the, uh, the criminal justice system and being incarcerated prior to their 16th birthday. Further speaking to the issue of the generational issues that incarceration can happen, can, can cause. Um, so just some other things to hit on, but they will be touched on by Bea a little bit further. Um, 
we all know, and Art mentioned as well, the, the disparities that can happen with incarceration. Um, we know with uh, the BIPOC population, you know, Black, Brown, um, Indigenous people of color, um, that they are disproportionately impacted. Um, with Black Americans specifically having seven times higher representation in, the, in incarceration um, than other racial identities. People living in poverty are more likely to be uh, incarcerated and are more likely to be unable to post bail or bond to get them out of pretrial detention. Um, and homeless individuals are 11 times more likely to be incarcerated um, than, the, than the standard population or than the housed population. Um, people with mental health and substance use disorders make up the majority of the people who become incarcerated with recent Berks County jail statistics putting that at 65% of the population at the jail having a mental health or substance use diagnosis. Um, and as Bea briefly mentioned, um, incarceration based on personal and professional experience um, does tend to have a negative or at, at, at worst exacerbating impact on individuals' mental health. So in summary, before passing it back to Bea, um, incarceration negatively impacts not only the individuals we're incarcerating, but children and their families and society at large. We as criminal justice reform advocates, we welcome more people under our umbrella and getting more people involved in the conversation um, to change and to progress um, the criminal justice reforms that we're hoping can take a foothold. And most notably at a time when the FBI statistics for 2023 show that crime is at a 63 year low, even though it might not feel like it from what we see, um, we all think that now is the best time to at least take some steps forward in instituting some possible changes um, to see if we can start making a difference. Um, we need more people in support of the evidence-based trauma-informed and restorative justice programs in different areas of the country that have already been instituted and shown to reduce crime rates, reduce recidivism rates, and get people out of the criminal justice system and living healthy and economically stable lives. I would like to thank you all so very much for your time today, and I will turn it back to Bea uh, for her part of this presentation. Thank you so much, Jordan. Um, so, you know, as Jordan was talking about, he, you know, talked about the tremendous impact that incarceration has on, um, individual well-being on the, the health of communities. I want to turn uh, to a different impact. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the impact that incarceration has on the local economy. Um, and this impact is really huge. Uh, we know that the jail affects people's ability to find employment, their earnings, and their economic mobility. We know this impacts people's individual well-being as well as the community at large. In Berks County uh, in 2023, about 78% of people, more than three quarters of people in the jail on a given day were of prime working age between the ages of 25 to 54. And if you compare that to the resident population, only 37% of the general Berks population was in that age group. So that means that a huge portion of the labor force is actually facing major barriers to full participation in the local economy. We know from research that employment helps formerly incarcerated people find economic stability after release. And we know this promotes greater public safety for everyone. Um, according to a survey of over 5 million formerly incarcerated people in the United States, we know that formerly incarcerated people are actually more likely than the general population to be actively looking for work. But because of the barriers they face, they have an unemployment rate that's about five times greater than the US population. And again, this has major impacts for the local economy um, in Pennsylvania and here in Berks County. According to the US Chamber of Commerce, Pennsylvania currently has only 66, job, uh, 66 available workers for every 100 open jobs. And Berks County specifically has a growing gap between entrance to the labor market and retirees with a shortage particularly acute in the advanced manufacturing sector. So clearly being able to fill these jobs is crucial to the county's continued economic health. 
Um, many of these jobs don't require a post-secondary education necessarily, but do require training and technical education. So there's just a huge opportunity for more programs in the community, both that remove barriers to employment for formerly incarcerated people, and also programs that help equip formerly incarcerated people looking for work to gain the skills that they need to be able to fill those jobs. Um, Jason will talk more about this uh, towards the end of the presentation, but employers can play a really big role in helping this along, both by becoming second chance employers and by just creating an environment that can help formerly incarcerated people be successful in the workplace. Um, but beyond this direct impact on the local workforce, the jail also impacts local taxpayers via the budget. So uh, first I wanted to start by giving you a general picture of how spending on public safety figures into the Berks County budget. So this, this is looking at how the county's general funds were, um, were going to be used in 2024. This is the adopted 2024 budget. Uh, the general county, uh, the general fund is the county's main checking account and it's funded primarily via property taxes. So this is what the county uses to fund all its primary functions like sanitation, libraries, roads, courts, and the jail. Uh, the chart shows for every $100 in available general funds, $29, almost a third of the budget went toward public safety, which is a category that includes the jail, as well as community corrections, uh, fire training, and emergency management. And then an additional $23 of every 100 went toward the judicial function, which includes everything the county spends on courts, the DA, public defenders, the sheriff, and pretrial services. So in total, that's more than half of the county's general funds, mostly via property taxes, going toward uh, criminal legal system expenses versus other activities in the county. And looking a little bit deeper, in 2024, the adopted budget for the jail was over $52 million, with 99% of that budget coming from the county's general fund. So this represents an extremely large burden on local taxpayers. In fact, it's the largest burden of any county function, with $22 of every $100 in general funds going to the jail alone. And this only represents the annual cost to operate the facility. But in recent years, the county had considered building a new facility, which it has estimated would cost approximately $300 million. And the county would need to pay for that by taking out debt and raising taxes. Um, this year, the county already had a budget deficit of about $46 million and had to increase the tax rate for the first time since 2018. Um, so compared to what the county spends on the jail, it's spending very few local tax dollars on programs and services that could actually reduce incarceration. So for example, the county uh, spends $2 of every 100 on public defenders who play an important role in reducing unnecessary detention by providing representation to indigent clients at trial. Only 39 cents of every 100 went to the Office of Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities, which provides a wide range of behavioral health services, including substance use disorder services, mental health treatment, case management, housing and vocational programs, and others. Only 37 cents went to Connections Work, the, county pre the county's pretrial services agency, and they help provide reentry services and to divert people from jail to alternatives in the community. And less than one cent uh, went to the Council on Chemical Abuse, a nonprofit that provides resources to fight addiction for the county. Um, these statistics are based on information available in the budget and what I could find online, but does not include every single initiative that the county funds that may contribute to lower jail populations, for example, like the DA's uh, marijuana diversion program or other pro programs funded via opioid settlement funds. Um, but some of the programs here depend almost entirely on state and federal grants for their funding, which means that budget cuts at the state or federal levels could put the continuation of these programs at risk. And there is opportunity for a lot more local funding of these types of initiatives. So given that so many uh, local public resources are going toward the jail, it's worth asking the question, does the spending actually keep people safe? So from having done research on jail populations all across the country, um, what I've seen is that contrary to what many people believe, the vast majority of people in local jails are not there due to serious or violent charges. Most are there because of issues related to poverty, homelessness, and substance use. And these are all issues that we know are better handled outside of the criminal legal system. 
In addition, the vast majority of people in jail are being held pre-trial, meaning they've been charged with an offense and are awaiting a court hearing, but are legally innocent. In Berks County, that's about 80% of people in the jail on any given day in 2022 that were held pre-trial. And that's higher than the statewide average of 72% in most of the counties that surround Berks County. Most people uh, held in jail pre-trial are there because they can't afford the bail set in their case. Um, so that means that someone who's got the same charges and more financial resources would be able to pay bail and keep their job and housing and fight their case from home in many cases. Um, what we know from the research about pretrial detention is that it leads to extremely harmful consequences for the people held without improving public safety. Spending time in jail pretrial has been shown to increase the likelihood that someone will be charged with a new crime in the future. And this is due to the disruption of interpersonal relationships, community ties, and job loss associated with detention. Um, in addition, people who are held pretrial are also more likely to plead guilty just to get out of jail, which has a huge number of consequences, like people receiving harsher sentences and then having a criminal record, which prevents them from uh, finding and keeping meaningful employment. Uh, in addition to some of what we know about research from jails and public safety, we can also look at this relationship um, in the local data. So if jails were truly effective in deterring crime, you would expect to see rising crime in response to declining jail populations. But that's not at all what you see in Berks County. In fact, over the last decade, uh, what we've seen is a decline in the jail population accompanied by a decline in crime. Uh, so starting with the jail population, um, this chart shows the jail incarceration rate in Berks County from 1970 to 2023. And compared to just looking at raw jail populations, the incarceration rate does account for changes in the resident population. So what we saw is, you know, similar to um, incarceration across the country, there was a rising trend of incarceration from the early 1980s until 2006, after which we see a general decline with some fluctuation and an accelerated decline after the onset of the pandemic in 2020, when the jail population dropped from over 1,000 to about 700 in 2022. During this time, the county also temporarily paused on its plans to build a new facility and explored ways to reduce the jail population. And similar to the jail population, crime in Berks County has been declining for at least the last decade, despite an increase in the resident population. Of course, we know this is not often how crime is portrayed in the media, but that's very different from what the statistics show. So according to a needs assessment that was done for the new jail, from 2007 to 2021, the total number of criminal offenses reported to law enforcement decreased by 52%, and actual arrests decreased by 46%. So overall, what these trends demonstrate is that it is possible to safely reduce jail populations without compromising public safety. And there's research coming out across the country looking at uh, criminal justice reform and their effects that, that show this in other places. Um, what we also see, however, during this time is that despite declining crime and jail populations, the county has continued to invest more money in the jail, even after accounting for inflation. Um, one important piece of context for this spending is that the Federal American Rescue Plan funds, which have been used over the last few years in Berks County to fund a large portion of the jail's operational expenses, they're no longer available after this year. So beginning this year, the jail has to rely more heavily on local taxes for its funding. And that will leave far fewer public resources available to pay for some of the supportive and preventative programs that actually prevent crime and interaction with the criminal legal system as well as programs uh, focused on workforce development that help support a thriving economy. So I want to introduce you now to Jason Halsey, who is a former reentry officer who also spent time in the jail and who has uh, direct experience with trying to find employment after incarceration. Uh, Jason, I think you're going to need to unmute. Good afternoon. Um, I know you guys heard a lot of stats and figures just now, um, and I'm here to paint uh, a picture of, of of the reality many face from after incarceration. Imagine for a moment that you've been completed, you just completed your time in prison 
after making one of the biggest mistakes in your life and stepping back into society without with the hopes of rebuilding your life. You have the, you have the skills, you have the drive, and you're ready to contribute positively. But then reality hits. The job market isn't welcoming. The opportunities are not available. Um, and the opportunities you, get, you do get do not align with the skills or, or your ambitions that you've been working so hard to develop. Um, when someone emerges from jail, they often find themselves boxed in to a very limited uh, employment landscape. Many available jobs are very labor intensive uh, or involve working environments that are far from ideal. Uh, either filthy condition, long, long physical demanding tasks. Um, while these jobs do do provide some income, they are really stepping stones to a meaningful career or or, or a path to success. They often are just survival jobs that you must jump to, uh, opt one to another, and never be able to be never becoming stable. Which covers which will cover cover the essentials, uh, but won't let you develop a path to career advancement. Um, I can personally relate to the struggles. Before my incarceration, um, I was I was a H, uh, human resource professional with a clear vision uh, to contribute to the workforce when I uh, was released in a meaningful way. Um, I got into a little trouble while working towards starting a, a, a personal small business of mine. However, after my release, the stark contrast between my previous career and the reality of the job market was jarring. Uh, but returning to the workforce, it was very labor intensive, um, and the conditions were, were really disheartening. Uh, the long hours left little room for further education or or or, or improvement on my end. Um, being through both sides of the system, I now understand the market, and I've come up with some action actionable ideas. Uh, to help the employment opportunities for individuals coming from from incarceration. Can you get to the next slide, please? Um, so pretty much for uh, trade education for entry-level positions. So if somebody's coming out of prison, um, I think small part, uh, small businesses really should partner up with uh, the local jail systems or judges or parole agents um, to, to provide some uh, incentive-based trainings, which provide scholarships or siphons, um, just to help them get through the program while while they're trying to uh, learn the trade uh, or or any any occupation. Um, like I said earlier, uh, really focus on focus on starting small, focus on partnering with small businesses. Um, most of the small businesses I know, uh, a lot of the owners are are former incarcerated people themselves. So I think if we connect more with those people um, and, and, and provide them incentives to to train um, people coming out, I think we have a much better uh, employment outcome. Um, and just promotion, uh, promoting the idea that if you put in the hard work and and and, and contribute to society, your employment will guaranteed um, or 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 highly or highly probable. I know guarantee is a rough word to use, but most people don't take the risk of taking any learning any trades because they they understand they have this large hard labor job but they have a job and they have a check every week so they won't make the the adjustment so if we if we really push a notion that they they're able to if they put in the work they really be able to to, to invest increment in their career I, I think that would be a, be a beautiful thing to do um next slide um and this is more for the hiring managers or or, or the hr a department in, in um in most of these Fortune 500 companies, uh, you can use case by case management instead of looking at a blank blanket statement of looking at people's charges. Uh, um, I know some places will look at your just if you have any kind of felony, they 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 won't let you in the door. I think a, a more case by case uh, assessments would, would be helpful. Skill based evaluations, uh, so. Instead of like I say, looking at somebody's background check, we look at all the skills they developed. I know I know many participants or people that have uh, families from seven years ago, and within that seven years, they have developed uh, gained so many certifications that can't find employment because of the felony. Uh, and pretty much employer education. So this 
educate the employers that uh that hiring hiring um people that that's just been in prison is, is beneficial to them. They're most likely hardworking. They're determined. Um, uh, they had a lot of time to learn. So I think they were hiring them would be ideal. Next slide, please. Um, and this is mostly for the recruiters and HR department again. Um, I, I would like to see training on a, on a recruiter side that, to, to identify soft skills, um, skills people developed not officially yet, on the job market, but some of their charges might translate to 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 soft skills. I think identifying that would be great. Um, skills based tools, pretty much develop assessments that focus on developing people's skills um, or, or their potential. So matching them um, if they have a, a, a distribution background, maybe a sales training course would be ideal. Something like that. Uh, and rehabilitation. Uh, realize people are people, and everybody there. There's a good number of people that want to change, and if they are given the opportunity to change, they they will. And and there's tools to change it that they will. The next slide. Um, and this is pretty much for uh, all the employers out there or small business owners. Um, I know there's a lot of felony felony friendly job fairs, um, but I would li like to see a lot more of them. Um, and individual companies have their own job fairs. We uh, great um, uh, and also uh, provide resources at the job fairs. So like BCC or a lot of the company uh, organizations that are involved in this phone call, make sure to be at these job fairs because uh, uh, resources are, are paramount. Um, and the work release programs. Uh, I've seen a lot of participant or uh, incarcerated people. Get involved with the workforce to release pro, uh, programs, and and they'll get sent to mundane jobs or jobs that they have no career. I understand like Dunkin' Donuts and baristas are are needed, but there's only so many baristas that we we, we will need. Um, so this partner with smaller uh, this partner with smaller um companies, um, for work release. I'm thinking like plumbers, electricians, a lot of trades, um, and on the job training would be ideal. Uh, and then just transition support. So when they're getting out of work work release, um, make sure they have the ideas of Social Security, how they understand how to fill out I nines, um, things like that. Uh, and this is just most, mostly for the uh, the counselor side of of, of, of the table. Um, just have enough resources for mental health. And mental health is a big deal. Um, coming like being being incarcerated and coming out is, is a terrible feeling. Not knowing what direction to go, feeling worthless. Um, so partnering with mentor, mentorship programs for people who's been involved, um, and 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 and, and rising to the occasion and change their lives. I think that 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 would be a great thing to promote. And financial literacy, um, I think it's one of the biggest uh, issues that we have with incarceration. A lot of a lot of these charges are just people don't understand the value of money. Or how how to stretch a dollar. So, I think if that if that opportunity is taught, I think we'd be able to get better results. Um, just to go over the employer incentives, um, the tax credits. I'm, I'm sure everybody knows. Um, wage subsidies, and you, you, uh, I, I know everybody would love a company that hires uh, past incarcerated people. Um, benefits to the employer, uh, it reduced tax liability again. Uh, initial cost is lower because it'd be hard. It'd be hard. To, the initial cost would be lower, uh, and, and, and your and your public image would be enhanced. Um, and like I said, uh, uh, incarcerated people are more likely to be willing to be hired. Um, the risk would be lower, and um. And they'll be motivated to work for you. So uh, I, I'd like to thank everybody for allowing me to speak here. Um, I know I know there's a lot of people with, with good intentions and power in in, in, the, in an audience, and I think um, I, I welcome you being on the side of the table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason.
Um, so we hope this information and in the presentation today has been uh, informative, has helped to highlight really why we think everyone should be asking questions about whether the way the local criminal uh, legal system works is really the best way to ensure public safety and to ensure the, the sustainability and the health of the community. And as employers and business leaders who especially have a huge stake in ensuring that public resources are allocated in ways that support the development of a thriving local economy. So we hope you'll use your voice to engage in these decisions and consider how you know, employers can help stand up programs that support formerly incarcerated people um, and engage in, in the local budget process, especially. Um, so that's it for us, Dave. Uh, I think now we might have time for some q and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Sure. Bea, thank you very, and, and uh, Jason and Jordan, thank you. Very, very interesting and helpful conversation. A um, little scary, but very good. Uh, there was a question uh, that was raised about uh, several years ago. There was a study that showed there were a lot of people being jailed for not paying fines, parents being jailed for not paying fines for their, their kids. Is that still a problem in Berks County that we know of? Um. You know, uh, I know that it's a problem in a lot of places. We're sort of fully in the throes of um, analyzing some data from the county, mostly um, from the jail. So I'm not 100% sure to what extent we'll be able to answer that question. But um, we we have heard, um, we know that this is legally, you know, people can be jailed for non-payment of fines and fees. We know this is a huge issue that um, that affects a lot of people who already more likely to be incarcerated. And, you know, when you're sort of um, already facing, you know, fines and fees, and then you're incarcerated for not being able to pay them, being in jail hardly helps you be able to afford those fines and fees. So it's sort of a, a nonsensical um, approach. Um, so sorry, that doesn't give you a complete picture. It, it does seem like this is something that um, is definitely at least legally possible in Berks County. We don't know the extent to which it's, it's happening. I don't know if other but folks it, on the call have more context though. But it's sort of problematic. That, yeah, I, I have some context, albeit uh, pretty old because I, I've been retired now a number of years, but I know that at the magisterial district judge level, as well as at the common pleas level, there's been substantial training to ensure that that kind of problem is, is lessened. And again, I know that, uh, you know, I'm now talking uh, six years down the road, six years ago, we were beginning to see a lessening of that kind of incarceration. I would expect that's probably uh, continued. Well, thank you, Art. Um, they actually do not, to answer your question, um, everybody's here with stats and stuff. They do not incarcerate for fines anymore, school fines. Um, they normally, if it's a school fine, have the children do um, community service. So most likely you will not be incarcerated for fines. Thank you, Slate. I was going to call on you to answer the question. So <laughs> appreciate you weighing in. Um, there, it was interesting that the data suggests that there are certain populations that are significantly at risk, uh, people with behavioral health, it sounded like disaffected youth and ch and and children's families get disrupted, and it also sounds like the minority populations are much more significantly affected by this. Is there any what what's your take on this? Bea, do you have any sense about that, or or Jordan? Yeah, I can. <clears throat> I can speak just a little to it. Um, urban populations tend to be more minority heavy um, and also tend to be poorer also. Um, they also tend to be more heavily policed. So the the more policing that goes on, the, the more that they become targeted. Um, and then they run into the bail system, which ends up keeping them incarcerated, whereas people of means can get out. Um, 
So it, it, there's a lot of different things. You know, we could go all the way back to the, the history of, of how policing started, um, but there's definitely a lot of measures um, that impact that um, still going on. And, you know, th there, there's progress being made, you know, here and there, piecemeal type stuff. Um, but, you know, what we're really talking about, like big picture is, is just a paradigm shift with the way the United States looks at the, the, the system of a, you know, policing and incarceration. Uh, we just have to, to really start moving into that uh, restorative uh, space. Um, you know, and that's coming, there are police, uh, you know, eight, uh, organizations and, and, and DA's organizations and public defenders organizations that, you know, they're all saying the same thing, you know, that there's gotta be some things that, that start changing, you know, so. Um, I'm going to turn it over to a couple people here to, to weigh in. There's a lot of conversation about sort of second chance opportunities. I'm going to first start with uh, Dan Fogarty. Dan, do you want to talk from the Workforce Development Board about this issue and how it impacts the workforce in Berks County? Yeah, Dave, thanks to, to the Alliance for pulling this together and uh, Judge Grimm, Jason Jordan. Um, Thank you for your presentations. And B, we love the analysis, right? I mean, that's really well put together. So, so thanks for that. Dave, you know, um, I guess what I would share with everybody on behalf of the board and the employers we work with and our partners in the community, um, 2024 is not 2014. In fact, it's not even 2019. Um, we have seen employers increasingly become more flexible in terms of uh, not just automatically discarding somebody because they checked a box on an application as they had in the past, because that wasn't working for them uh, prior to the pandemic and certainly not coming out of the pandemic. So we're seeing employers increasingly adopting better practices to look at the uh, entirety of what an applicant might bring to them. That being said, there is a major issue that people who've been incarcerated um, have to be prepared to deal with, and they have a problem with their work history if they've been away or if they've been away multiple times. And work history still remains a very valid uh, basis for an employment decision. So um, we're fortunate that we have uh, partners here in the community that can help uh, uh, these individuals do things to supplant that work history a little bit. And you know how big a fan we are here, Dave, of the R3 program that be, that Connection Works uh, does. And uh, people check it out. It's, a, it's a, I believe, still the only registered pre-apprenticeship program for folks with uh, returning citizens in the Commonwealth. So we're lucky to have that here in Berks County. It gets a lot of community support and a lot of success. Um, the one thing I would say is I did put in the chat earlier if anybody wants to see how 2024 is different than 2014, I'd encourage them to come down to the Double Tree on Monday, October 7th for the Connection Works Job Fair. And what you will see is many more employers than you would have seen 10 years ago. And the quality and breadth of those employers, including some of our best employers in the county, will be there and in a hiring mood. You know, sometimes when these kind of events took place, 2012, 2013, 2014, you got employers who were doing it because frankly, they were good citizens and they wanted to show support. Now they are joined by many, many employers who are looking for talent. So um, uh, just what you can see in terms of the shift of the number of employers and the quality of jobs and the way they handle the discussions um, will be on display on October 7th. I encourage people to get down there. Hope that helps, Dave. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to ask a uh... Peggy Kirshner to jump on here for a second and talk a little bit about the work that they're doing connected to what you said. Peggy, hopefully you're able to do this. I think I'm able. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks. And thank you, Dan, for this shout out. Um, so yeah, and I would, you know, concur with everything that that Dan said. And I know there I was involved in a couple of questions in the chat, and I see Bill Clemens has asked the question. Uh, so in addition to our registered pre-apprenticeship program that Dan so kindly mentioned, um, you know, that is um, that we have five uh, cohorts of that program with about 14 or 15 people in every year. So we are 
um, really helping to, you know, skill up those folks that are in that program and set them on a great pathway. In addition to that program, um, we have the, the ability and the capacity to serve anybody in Berks County who has been justice involved. All they have to do is walk in our door between eight and five, Monday through Friday. Um, that is thanks to a grant from the United Way of Berks County um, as we had applied for uh, that grant when they received the Mackenzie Scott donation several years ago. And um, in equities and workforce development was one of the uh, focuses of that grant. So um, to folks like Bill, if you're saying names of employers, send your folks our way. We have a whole infrastructure built around helping people who are justice involved not only get themselves prepared um, and get a great resume, but as I had said in the chat, um, our case managers can work with our employment development team who are out there in the community, tirelessly knocking on doors. As Dan mentioned, getting more of those doors opened than they did years ago, and even having some you know, employers whose doors they might have knocked on for years calling us now to say they want to talk about hiring individuals with, with the record. Like anything, they're going to look at the person. Um, if we know, if we've worked with that person, if they're in R3, especially the, the registered pre-apprenticeship program, that's an eight-week commitment that they made in this program. And so we have eight weeks of great references, hopefully, to give an employer about the person. But even beyond that, um, if they're in one of our traditional workforce programs and we have case management staff who spent time with them, they've been through our classes, you know, we're helping them get stabilized, which is the other part of the part of this that I think Jason touched on a little bit. Um, their, their lives might be somewhat unstable. So while the job absolutely is needed, it's not the only thing they need. They, they may have transportation issues. They may not have valid ID. They don't have... $80 for the work boots that they're going to need to get that job. So those are all things that when we've got the person here and if they are, um, you know, willing to kind of be part of our process and, and, and get the help, um, we can provide resources to that. And that's done through a variety of funding sources, considering um, in addition to our own development efforts, but, um, you know, beyond the, the resources of staff time, you know, we spend probably 80 or $90,000 a year on bus passes, Uber gift cards, uh, boots, black pants and all that. So um, it's kind of an all encompassing issue. The good news is for Burks, we're here eight to five, Monday through Friday, we're at 19 North 6th Street, right across from the courthouse, right in the middle of the downtown, very easily accessible. Uh, Maggie, uh, there was a question about whether you have bilingual services. You're, you're muted, Dave. No, I shouldn't be. Can you hear me? You're 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 not muted, Dave. <laughs> Peggy, the question uh, was whether or not you do bilingual services. Yes, this I'm is... sorry if I couldn't hear you, Nikki. Are you are you asking? <laughs> I'm sorry, Nikki. Had we're both we share it. Yep. I share an office. Okay, we do have uh, many bilingual staff. Yes, yeah, so everything we do um, can be done for someone who does not, who speaks Spanish, mm -hmm. except for our three. They're that, yeah, because of our partners that we contract with to provide the um, technical training portion of that, um, but everything else is available. I'm going to uh, quickly go to the two people who are responsible for this program. And originally, one is uh, Jane Palmer. Who's, he's raising her hand. So, Jane, I'll let you talk. And then I'm going to call on Crystal really quickly at the end. And then our, I'll let, have you close. Great. So, thank you so much, Dave. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I I really appreciate the, the, the work that we're doing in the community sort of post-release. I think that the Connections works um programs are amazing also the real deal 610 which helped us with the um the uh, the listening tour where we interviewed 120 um formerly incarcerated people has um a lot of um 
lot of services to offer people who are um, re-entering, returning citizens. Um, I just want us all to remember that part of the point of this is more upstream. It's to reduce the number of people who get locked up in the first place. It's terrific. We need to do a whole lot more for people who are coming out of jail. But I just want to remind us of that statistic about um, who gets incarcerated in the first place. It's people of color. It's people experiencing mental health, behavioral issues. It's people with substance abuse problems. Um, it's people who get who are on parole and get caught up in one tripwire after another. Um, I think this is a quote from Peggy, and there this is the there are aspects of the system that make it difficult for people to succeed. So I just I want us all as we leave this excellent presentation to remember um that our economy, our community, our whole quality of life here in Berks County will be better off if we can have fewer people in the jail in the first place. And Crystal, to you one last time, and then uh, back to Art. Okay, I'll keep it quick. I want to thank everyone for spending this time to attend this. And the presenters, thank you so much, and to Berks Alliance. Um, I guess if I had to sum up what I wanted and what I think we need to make any kind of progress is interconnectedness and really creative thinking. Things that have not been thought to do before. We need to work together. We need to do things differently. Um, the first thing that's gonna come up for all of us, uh, criminal justice related wise, is there's gonna be a juvenile detention center. And that is needed and I understand that, but it needs to be done in a way that is different than it is normally done because we can see through lawsuits what happens when it's done the same old way. So um, I guess it's a call to, a <laughs> to action. Um, we would love to have you work with us and thank you so much. Thank you, Crystal. And Art, to you, thank you. First of all, thank you for moderating this Art and, and and Bea, thank you for all your work on the research, but don't have much time left, so I'm going to turn it back to Art really quickly. And I'm going to be really quick, just uh, repeating what I said, good people working to, together can make a difference. And what I find particularly heartening about today is that in our community, there's so many good people that have made such a difference and continue to do so. And the measure of what I think is the good work that's being done here is that we are willing as a community to look outside to experts like Vera to come in and offer what they have to offer. I think that's the measure of a program that's on its way to being just outstanding. So thank you very much everybody for tuning in and I hope it was helpful for all of you. Thank you everyone, I, I really appreciate this. We will uh, be sending the video out to everybody. We'll send the PowerPoint to everybody. Uh, it may take a little while for us to get through that, but. Uh, very interesting, very strong program. I want to thank our panelists, uh, Bea, uh, Jordan, and Jason. Terrific job. It was very inf informative, a little frightening, but informative. Um, so we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Look for the uh, video to come to your uh, email box. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you.